Humo di Sujie, Nani Ka, Final Battle, Final Battle. The day after Kuya fell, we returned once again to the Elro Great Labyrinth via Ranan Sama's teleportation, and pressed on. We had had no choice but to retreat again to recover from the wounds and weakened stamina we endured during the battle when Kuya had halted our advance. However, even while we were recovering, battles were continuing. The battle between Water Dragon Inasan and Sophia seems to have developed into a quagmire. In short, it's due to Water Dragon Inasan focusing on buying time and Sophia being unable to attack properly. The upper layer of the Elro Great Labyrinth is a chaotic mess of zones filled with water, zones with that water having been frozen and zones that are still undamaged. If we entered such a place, it feels like we'd soon die to one thing or another. While the battle between Inasan and Sophia is at a stalemate, the battle above the ground is over. The Queen Terratact was defeated. However, while the combined armies of the humans and demons fought hard, they took heavy damage when the remnants of the nightmare flooded out from the Elro Great Labyrinth, forcing them to retreat. That being said, given how the upper layer of the Elro Great Labyrinth is like a vision of hell currently, even if the joint army had won they likely wouldn't have been able to invade the Elro Great Labyrinth. That can also be said of the remnants of the nightmare that repelled the joint army, and apparently they're wandering about on the surface. So the overall situation is at a stalemate. However, that will only last until the battle between Inasan and Sophia is over. Though Inasan is said to be the strongest of the dragons, Apparently Sophia has the upper hand in battle. Water and ice. They might have similar attributes, but ice has a better affinity. That's because ice can stop all water attacks by freezing them. Due to that Inasan is stymied. However, in Sophia's case she is forced to deal with the submergence of the Elro Great Labyrinth. As a result of having to keep freezing the water flowing in to contain the submergence, she can't keep her focus on the battle with Inasan. Net result, it's a state mail. However, that doesn't change the fact that Sophia has several advantages, so Inasan will likely be beaten sooner or later. When that happens the situation will change. Once Sophia is free and if the situation in the upper layer of the Elro Great Labyrinth settles down, then the remnants of the nightmare that remain above ground will also be able to return to the Elro Great Labyrinth. If that happens then the situation will tilt against us precipitously. Sophia's strength is above that of Inasan, the strongest dragon. We've already lost Gukasan to Kuya, and my soul is apparently in tatters due to excessive use of kindness's resurrection. I will probably only be able to use Resurrection a few more times. With the Demon King still to be confronted, we have no spare forces to fight with Sophia. Therefore, before Inasan and Sophia's battle finishes, we've got to defeat the Demon King no matter what it takes, then we must reach the system's nexus after going through the bottom layer of the Elro Great Labyrinth. However, when I was confronted by the scene before me, I inadvertently shrunk back. With Kuya's death, with my own soul being eroded away, I was repeatedly confronted by the fact that I hadn't resolved myself enough. Which is why I had decided that this time for sure I would resolve myself, but that resolve seems almost to be vanishing due to the scene before me. Is resolution alone enough to overturn this? The bottom layer of the Elro Great Labyrinth. The Demon King is waiting for us here. There are two Queen Terratacks stationed beside her. In addition to the Demon King and the Queens, there are spider monsters surrounding them in formation. Their number can't be determined at a glance. More than half of them are merely weak individuals, but even so the sheer number of them is stunning such that it is more than enough to impart a sense of visceral despair. We have to break through this? Hi, good of you to make it here, representatives of humanity. 
The Demon King's voice resounds. I had heard that voice once before during the declaration of the world quest, but seeing the Demon King in the form of a young girl feels out of place. In novels and the like there's even Demon Kings who look like beautiful girls, but facing that in reality is very disconcerting. It's like, the more obviously vicious looks she had the less hesitation we would have had. That I'm thinking such things, perhaps shows that I'm still not resolved enough. No matter who the opponent is, no matter what they look like, I shouldn't let my blade falter before them. Yet, the very form of the Demon King as a weak girl sitting on a chair, is enough to shake my determination. Even though I said it was good of you to make it here, it's not like I actually wanted you to come, you know. But, since you've made it here I guess I have to. While the dragons might not have any choice, I had at least wanted you reincarnators to be away from the war though. I'm sure she's speaking her honest feelings. I sensed that somehow from the tone of her voice. The Demon King's personality shone through from her words, again shaking my determination. In the first place, this war is due to the need to break out of a hopeless situation. It's not like the Demon King caused it or wanted to cause it. It's not a matter about which side is correct, but simply because we must choose who gets sacrificed. One side will be abandoned, allowing the other side to live. Will humanity live, or will the gods live? That choice gives a broken result either way. We'll have to fight sooner or later here, but before that let's at least get one thing out of the way. Ahem, this time I'll go with a stereotypical Demon King's phrase. The Demon King clears her throat for a moment. Welcome hero. If you become my ally I shall grant you half of the world. How about it? Those lines were a parody of the Demon King from a famous game back in my previous life in Japan. Despite feeling strangely nostalgic, I smile wryly at how well those words match the current situation. I'm sure that the Demon King learned those words from Wakabasan. The humor in those lines might well be out of place here, but since I know those lines were spoken in earnest, I must reply with my true feelings in turn. I am sorry. But my answer is, no. After all, I have come here so that all of humanity, half of the world, will not be sacrificed. Gotcha. That's too bad. Saying so, the Demon King lightly shrugs her shoulders. I'm sure that the Demon King herself didn't expect her proposal to be accepted either. No doubt she couldn't go without saying that and betting on a ray of hope. I sure understand those feelings. Then, let's do it. Responding to the Demon King's voice, beginning with the Queen Teratax, the spider monsters begin to move. It's begun. It really has begun. The battle between the hero and the Demon King that will decide the fate of the world. My own power as the hero might be tiny, but even so, I cannot afford to lose. Final battle. Now then, despite my casual verbal barbs earlier, the situation is bad. Our main forces are two queens. Normally, queens would surpass ancient dragons. However, as a result of Shirochan eating a part of their souls, they've weakened. Most likely the queens are currently only about equal with the ancient dragons. Facing us are five ancient dragons. Darkness Dragon Reese. Fire Dragon Gwen. Wind Dragon Hyavan. Ice Dragon Nier. Light Dragon Biaku. All of them are a troublesome lot. Gwen simply has all abilities at a high standard. Although his instantaneous power isn't comparable to the others, he's much more consistent. Hyavan's speciality is in aerial combat so in high-speed combat there is no one superior. Fortunately the Elro Great Labyrinth is an enclosed space which means that he can't freely fly through the sky, so his power could be said to be cut by half. Even so, his ability to manipulate air can't be disregarded. Nier is an annoying opponent. With ice and curses, 
her speciality is to use those two abilities to steadily whittle away her enemy's stamina. Even so, she possesses a defensive ability second only to Gakia, the deceased leader of the Earth Dragons. She's a nasty opponent since a war of attrition would be to our disadvantage, yet her defensive ability would force us into a war of attrition. Byaku is a support specialist. In exchange for being nothing special in terms of fighting strength, she is able to drastically enhance the abilities of one other person. Since Byaku is wrapped around the arms of Yamada-kun's Imuto-chan, it seems that she's the one being strengthened. A human strengthened to the same level as an ancient dragon. In addition, Byaku herself is a master of healing magic, so can perform the healer role. Finally, Reese is perhaps the most troublesome when considering the consequences. Alright. What should I do? Well, the first move is obvious enough right? Using my skill I give instructions to the queens. They move in response. All the spider type monsters in this place simultaneously rushed down. On Yamada-kun. Wah? Protect the hero kid. Gwyn shouts. He looks desperate. Well, naturally. The weakest one here is Yamada-kun. The reason why Yamada-kun is here is simply because he is the owner of the ruler skill of kindness. That, combined with the effect of the kindness skill being revival of the dead. Because that revival of the dead was repeatedly used to resurrect the ancient dragons, Rathkun exhausted all his strength. It's a matter of course to target Yamada-kun who is the weakest in this place, yet owns that annoying ability to revive the dead. No hard feelings, okay. But I have decided that I wouldn't care about appearances anymore. Whether or not you're a reincarnator, if you are hostile then I will kill you. Rathkun offered himself up while being a reincarnator. If we made him go that far, then we cannot do any less. The other side should be the same. In the battle with Rathkun, Lightning Dragon Guka exhausted all his strength and offered himself up. If neither of us will back down, then the only option is to make every effort possible. In addition, in that dialogue between us earlier, Yamada-kun gave his answer. Thus, holding back is unnecessary. I shall kill you without the slightest mercy. The flood of spiders have run into a barrier and stopped moving forwards. Oishima-kun's chastity skill ha. Huh? The chastity skill has the ability to create a powerful barrier. There's not much difference between Oishima-kun and Yamada-kun, in fact she's weak enough that she's even less suited to being in this place than Yamada-kun, but that barrier alone is strong enough that she has the right to take part in this battle. However, it's not like it can't be broken. Surely not. The two queens fire their breath attack at the same time. Even if it's a barrier created by a ruler skill, that's not strong enough to withstand a simultaneous breath attack from two queens. In addition, as she is the one putting up the barrier, she cannot escape from inside the barrier. It was the moment when the barrier she put up to protect those inside, became a prison. Still, the enemy is not so naive as to allow such an obvious attack. Gwen and Hyavan change into dragon form, then use their own breath attacks to launch a counter-attack against the breath attacks from the two queens. The fire and wind breath attacks merge together, with the synergy between them amplifying the force as it collides with the breath attacks from the two queens. The result, is that they cancel each other out. Hmm. Oh. Gwyn and Hyavan tilt their heads to the side in confusion. Damn. Did they sense that the queens are weakened from that? I'm sure it wouldn't be considered proof, but it probably made them suspicious. Also, since we have no reason to be going easy on them, it's only a matter of time until the weakened state of the queens is revealed. If this is dragged out, our weaknesses will be exposed. Well, that's so only so long as it is dragged out though. Ten shadows approach Yamada-kun and Ko, 
having hid behind the eye-catching breath attacks from the queens, the puppet pterotacts. Their form is not particularly different from humans. If you ignore them having six arms that is, the true form of the puppet pterotax is a spider-shaped monster about the size of a fist, but they fight inside a puppet created by their own thread by manipulating it. Their form as a six-armed human is simply a puppet. The ten puppet pterotax simultaneously rush down on Yamada-kun and Co. The status values of the puppet pterotax are about 10,000. While they cannot take on an ancient dragon, Yamada-kun and Oashima-kun are no match for them. In addition, although they cannot take on an ancient dragon, they're not so weak as to allow those ancient dragons to mow them down with a single blow each. They're strong enough that if two of them took on one ancient dragon, it's the dragon that would be in danger. At any rate, only the queens and puppet pterotax will be effective against the ancient dragons. Even an arch pterotax probably wouldn't be of much use. In short, most of the spider-shaped monsters in this place aren't particularly useful. In terms of fighting strength, we're the ones at a disadvantage. That being the case, we have only one option. A swift attack. Standing before the looming puppet pterotax are Gwen, Hyavan, Nier and Ri still in humanoid form, and Yamada-kun's Emoto-chan with Biako wrapped around her arm. In terms of numbers we have the advantage, but in terms of simple combat strength we are at a disadvantage. The puppet pterotax and ancient dragons clash with each other, contending with the other. The puppet pterotax aim for a gap between the ancient dragons to attack Yamada-kun and Oashima-kun, with the ancient dragons trying to prevent them. During the violent exchanges, they both await for the chance to strike. However, my dear ancient dragons, have you forgotten something? The queens are still here you know? Seriously? Are they going to take out their own allies? Once again the light of the breath attack builds in the mouths of the queens. The puppet pterotax are also in the line of fire, but that's fine. If we can bring down Yamada-kun and Oashima-kun with their ruler skills here, we'll be able to thwart their plans. The victory condition for the Black God supporters is not to beat us, but to take those holding ruler authority to the system nexus which is located beyond the door behind me, to stop the collapse of the system. For that reason, those with ruler authority must live. Therefore, if we can bring down the three valid holders in Yamada-kun, Oashima-kun, and Emuto-chan, then it'll be our victory even if we die. This is bad. It can't be stopped. The ancient dragons attempt to stop the queens from firing their breath. However, the puppet pterotax prevent that. Despite the fact that if the queens fire their breath, then they would get caught up in it as well. The puppet pterotax too are prepared to lose their lives in this battle. In order to repay their devotion, I won't hesitate either. Fire. At my signal, the breath attack from the two queens is released. The attack smashed through the barrier that Oashima-kun had put up, directly hitting Yamada-kun and Ko. Just before that occurred. Harmony. I heard the voice of a man who shouldn't have been here. In addition, the breath attack from the two queens that should have been a direct hit on both the puppet pterotax and the enemies, disappeared without causing any effect. Huh? I can't keep up with the changing situation. As if to express that momentary blank in my thoughts, the ancient dragons strike the puppet pterotax. The puppet pterotax had also stopped moving for an instant. They're not weak enough to be done in by a single strike, but in an instant the situation has suddenly become unfavorable. While grimacing about that, I glare in annoyance at the man who caused this situation. Dustin. Over there, was the Pope of the Divine Word Religion, Dustin. Final battle. When did Dustin get here? How? The answer to that was with the elderly wizard standing alongside Dustin. He is Ronan, 
a space magic user who is famous as the strongest human. I guess he brought dust in here using teleportation. But for what reason? Even during the battle with Rathcon, Ranon simply laid low. That's because if by some chance the teleport user Ranon was done in, then they would have lost their way of escaping. The same could be said of Dustin. Yamada-kun, Oishima-kun, and Imuto-chan all possess a ruler skill, but I had thought Dustin was staying in a safe location in case they were annihilated. I hadn't expected Dustin to show up unless we had been defeated and his safety could be guaranteed. Despite all that, why is he here now? No, I guess I don't need to think too hard about this. Surely this means that he too no longer cares about appearances. He said harmony, right? The skill that made it as if the breath attack of two queens never existed. That's likely a special skill. A title is given by obtaining a ruler skill, and by gaining that title two skills are obtained, this is the second of those two skills. In the case of my gluttony, it was the sublimation skill. The harmony skill that Dustin activated is likely the same sort. I don't know precisely what happened due to the harmony skill. However, it's certain that the breath attack of two queens was completely neutralized. In short, I should consider the harmony skill as being capable of defending against the breath attacks of two queens at a minimum. Well, it doesn't look like he's able to spam it though. Blood gushed out from all over Dustin's body. It must be the backlash against using the harmony skill. Skills have various kinds of costs when used, but the cost when using a special skill is huge. I can't readily use my sublimation skill either. Actually, I've never used it. The cost is such that you wouldn't think of using it. The cost of harmony can be clearly seen, it's enough that Dustin is on the verge of death. However, considering that Dustin was able to nullify the breath attack of two queens despite having almost no fighting ability, you could say that it was an exceptionally good result in terms of cost effectiveness. But, that's exactly why I can't stand it. I use my skills to give instructions. I'll have the queens and puppet Teratax continue to be the opponents of the ancient dragons. I give a different order to the arches, graders, and the rest of the mob. Their target is... Dustin. It would be strange not to target a non-combatant on the verge of death. No, the Pope is being targeted. Ignore me and focus on the targets in front of you. Gwyn noticed the movements of the Teratax and began to move to protect Dustin, but the one who put a stop to that was Dustin himself. He's here to win even if he has to discard his own life. Cutting off his own path of retreat, leaving him unable to back out. In practice, if the ancient dragons lose here then Dustin and Co. will be out of options. If that happened then the Black God faction wouldn't be able to do anything more than pray that Jayuri wins. That's probably why he rushed into this place. I had made light of him by expecting that he would be a spectator from a safe location, but instead that expectation has been overturned. However, I won't let him interfere any further. Dante take me lightly. However, the flood of Teratex heading for Dustin were mowed down by flames. It's Ronan's fire magic. Damn, he's not called the strongest human mage for nothing huh? With that attack, everything weaker than a greater was wiped out. Even the greater Teratex have severe wounds. I guess the arch Teratex are just about equal? Despite being a human, you're quite strong aren't you? Of course he's weak compared to the ancient dragons. However, he's effective enough in combat that he can't be ignored. No, it's not just Ranon. It's similar for Oishima-kun with her barriers, but even Yamada-kun is slowly defeating the Teratacts. It seems that Yamada-kun could also defeat a greater by himself. It seems that I've taken these humans a bit too lightly. While that is going on, the puppet Teratex are starting to be pushed back. Sure enough, 
It was too much for the puppet Teratex to take on the ancient dragons, huh? I immediately gave directions to the queens to reinforce them, but as if ignoring those orders one of the queens placed her huge body in front of me. My line of sight is blocked by the huge queen. Almost reflexively I activate clairvoyance, peering through the queen's body to grasp the situation. There I see Reese, with his arm held out towards me in the posture of having fired something. He was about to attack me huh? He probably fired magic or something. The queen protected me by risking herself. The queen's judgment was correct. It was correct, but, now it has been exposed. That I, have gotten weak. To the other side, I should have been the greatest threat from the start. Even if all the ancient dragons had come at me together, I would have beaten them, if I had been in my prime. That I'm not doing so, should have created some doubts in their minds. That doubt, should have become conviction with the queen moving to protect me. I wouldn't have needed any damn protection if I'd been in my prime. The fact that the queen protected me, means that it was necessary. Reese sidesteps two puppet Teratax attacking him, shoving them to the side. Using that gap he dashes forwards. Towards me. His eyes are fixed straight upon me. So he's completely targeting me then. Since I had targeted Yamada-kun and Dustin, I can't blame Reese's response. The two queens move to intercept Reese. The queens fire their breath at Reese. It's not possible for him to evade that. No matter that they've been weakened, the queens still are on PAR with an ancient dragon. If Reese directly receives the breath attack from two queens, then even an ancient dragon like him would not get away with it. Harmony. However, that's only if the attack is received directly. Dustin's special skill was activated again. The breath attack from the queens should have hit him directly, but Reese rushes through the breath attacks without having received any damage. That harmony skill wasn't about raising defensive power at all, instead it completely nullifies damage huh? The two queens quickly struck down at Reese with their legs, but perhaps due to the harmony skill even that wasn't effective. Reese charged straight to my location without pause. Then, his hand struck out towards my chest. Final battle. I have been seeking a place to use my abilities. Seeking a place where I could die while using that power to my heart's content. We who are referred to as the ancient dragon's leaders are simply poor imitations of true dragons. We are chimeras created during Potamus's experiments. Unlike the humanoid chimeras such as Ariel who were protected by the goddess Cyril's orphanage, we ancient dragon leaders are closer to true dragons in appearance. Because of that we weren't given any protection by people, and were treated as animals. In places unknown to us we might well have had brethren who were treated like laboratory animals and died. Or rather, that probably did happen. The one who protected us was our Lord Jayuri Dastodis Sama. For that reason, we hold our Lord in deep respect. It is surely similar to the feelings Ariel has for the goddess Surreal. If there's one major thing that's different between us and Ariel, it would be that the system considers us to be monsters. Even in the eyes of God, we were just animals. Which is why we made the choice to become the kin of our Lord. We gave up on intermingling with people, but despite that we refused to simply become monsters, becoming instead managers of our kin. Each of us took up respective roles in that, increasing the numbers of our kin, preparing the foundations for how we would live in this world. Hyavan cleaned the polluted wastelands. Inna took control of the oceans to prevent people going out to sea. Nir, Rendo, and Guka took charge of various lands, managing them. Wherein, I took responsibility for sealing the Demon King's sword. The main reason for that was that there was no land suitable for me to manage. In addition, the other reason is that my abilities are rather specialized compared to the others. If it happens that the Demon King's sword is used, 
then that might also be the time when my power is needed. For that reason, I was sealed along with the Demon King's sword. I intentionally developed my abilities in certain categories. Namely, anti-god abilities. Abilities that would be effective against gods. In other words, the ability to attack the soul. Heresy attacks that directly harm the soul. Corrosion attacks that grant death. Abyss magic that extinguishes the soul. I focused most of my skill points on improving such things. All of that was done in case gods ever invaded this world. However, such a scenario is highly improbable. According to our Lord, our Lord Superior, the high-ranking administrator Disama, is an eminent god who is particularly feared amongst the gods. It's doubtful whether any god would come to a world administered by Disama. If they did they would likely be highly ignorant. Therefore, my existence was merely insurance. As preparation for the inconceivable yet absolutely critical event that gods ever invaded. However, although I exist to be insurance, I'm far too ineffective at that. If gods ever invaded, the first one to respond would be my lord. So if I ever got my turn, it would be after my lord has already lost. If it was an opponent that my lord couldn't beat, then I couldn't possibly win. Therefore, I'm too weak to be useful as insurance. It would be unreasonable to take no countermeasures, but even countermeasures are limited. That is what I am. I'm a being who makes little difference whether I'm here or not, if the occasion ever arose where my lord lost and I got my debut on the stage, it's virtually guaranteed that I would lose on my debut. It makes me laugh. I'm here as insurance for the one in a thousand chance that my lord loses and the one in a billion chance that I can beat his opponent. A being who exists for the faint reason of just maybe. For that reason, I didn't understand the reason for my existence. I wanted a place where I could shine. A place where I could wield these powers. A place where my existence could be properly validated. That is surely this place? My hand shot out at Ariel. It's too late for her to avoid it. She can't guard against it either. Ariel appears to be considerably weakened for some reason. She made no sign of getting up from her chair despite the battle having already begun and it felt out of place when she left everything to her subordinate teratacts. However, when a queen protected her that was when I had the first definite proof. Ariel is currently so weakened that she can't even fight properly. If Ariel had had her strength, she would have had no need to rely on subordinates like the queens and puppet teratacts. Ariel has the strength to annihilate us ancient dragons by herself. But she doesn't, she can't. And finally, a queen protected her against an attack that wouldn't normally have even scratched her. It is certain. I've got her. Immediately on thinking that, my arm was grabbed from the side. My hand was stopped just before it reached Ariel's body. The hand that had grasped my arm stretched out from empty space. Then, something suddenly struck my body and that something and I was sent crashing into the ground, rolling over and over in a heap. When I scrambled to my feet and saw what that something was, I was dumbfounded. My lord. It was my beloved lord, Jayuri Distodis Sama. His body is in tatters and covered in wounds, the light is gone from his eyes and his gaze is staring vacantly staring into space. Don't tell me, he's, actually, dead. While I was frozen in shock, someone appeared next to me. The reason why I wasn't attacked despite having taken leave of my senses, was because this person was also covered in wounds. Her white clothes were dyed with patches of blood, and her lower spider body was also covered in red patches. One of her eyes had been ruined, continuously leaking blood as if shedding tears. Despite having such a painful looking appearance, her remaining eye blazed with determination. As if to protect Ariel, the white god appeared in front of me. Final battle. That was too close. On defeating Kuro, 
The very moment when I returned it seemed that the Demon King was about to be killed. It would have been bad if I'd been even a tenth of a second later. Seriously bad? It was so bad that my heart feels like it's about to burst out of my chest. Sigh, let's, yeah, take a moment to relax. Okay, assess the situation. Behind me is the Demon King. She's safe. Yep. In front of me is a Draconian. He's shaped like a person, but has dragon-like traits in his appearance. I'm sure that there were guys like this in the 9th army that Kuro led. This guy is the one guilty of trying to kill the Demon King just now. Additionally, some distance away there's Yamada-kun and his party plus four dragons, huh? It's them vs the puppet Teratax eh? It seems that while the dragons were busy fighting with the puppet Teratax, the other Teratect type monsters rushed down on Yamada-kun and co. The puppet Teratex are being pushed back, but it's not enough that they'll collapse soon. Also, they're some distance away so I'll ignore them for now. Conclusion. For now it's totally okay to kill the Draconian in front of me. Don't tell me that it's too simplistic to kill whichever enemy looks to be the closest. It's generally a good idea to blow away the enemies close to you on a battlefield. As if you can be picky about your enemies on a battlefield you Cretan. Blow them away as soon as you spot them? Search and destroy. It's search and destroy? I'm strangely hyper? Well, that's because I piled up a load of frustration during my little rendezvous with Mr. Kuro here. Battles between gods put a terrible strain on your nerves, you know. There's tussles over territory and tussles over energy usage. Even when you attack, you gotta calculate how much you'll reduce your enemy's energy by. Even when defending, you have to calculate by how much the enemy's attack will reduce your own energy, then recalculate how much energy you'll expend in defense while recovering from your injuries. It basically means that you have to do continuous split-second calculations in the middle of a pun hop, okay? I'm both mentally worn out and physically worn out. If you went with all-out flashy attacks, then despite being on the attack you'd be expending more energy than the other side, putting yourself at a disadvantage overall you see. It's like, you're playing speed chess with a wait time of zero, yet, you still have to calculate a thousand moves ahead else you'll lose. While punching each other too. Man that was hard. I had to go with the persistent belief that the moment you make a mistake it's over the whole time after all. Incidentally, despite not making a real mistake I still ended up like this, you know? My whole body is a wreck. One of my eyes was crushed. Incidentally, it's impossible to repair it. I guess that's what makes him a proper god huh, as it seems he had some technique to block my body from being restored and I was wounded while he made full use of it. It's not like I absolutely cannot heal though, more like it'll consume a lot of energy to forcibly heal it, so healing is on hold until the battle is over. However, since I've beaten the biggest obstacle in Kuro, the rest is done and dusted. Now then, let's whack this Draconian for starters at eh? Shiro-chan. But, just when I was about to go the Demon King called out to me from behind. I turned my head around while being on guard against the Draconian. The Demon King was gazing at me with a complicated expression. Relief, delight, but also grief? Ah, for Kuroha. From the Demon King's perspective, Kuro is someone that she's known for a long, long time after all. So once he was defeated she had complex feelings about it despite him being hostile huh? That's, alive. Eh? Uh, oh, is that so? Therefore, I decided I should report that Kuro is alive for now. He looks dead for sure, but he's genuinely alive despite all that. I guess you could say that since gods are semi-independent of their physical body, Destroying their flesh is not necessarily enough for them to die. Both that body and his original body are basically done for at any rate. 
Currently he has taken too much damage and is also exhausted. It's doubtful whether his body can be revived so he certainly looks dead, but he's genuinely alive. Well, since I made sure that he won't be able to revive any time soon, it should be quite some time before he'll be able to move again though. I see. Then I can fight without worry. That's hard to make out? It's really hard to make out what this guy is saying due to his peculiar voice, but this draconian actually thinks he'll be able to fight me? Hiari I come. The draconian approaches me. Hmm? His speed isn't particularly high. This is going to be simple enough to avoid. Wait. There's a nasty feeling coming from the draconian's fist. I instinctively realize that I mustn't take that blow. This feeling is, a heresy attack? The heresy attack skill has the effect of directly damaging the soul. It's even effective against gods, or rather, it's basically a skill that exists to be used to take on gods. I did try my best to replicate this heresy attack, but it was so difficult that I abandoned the idea. You can see Dee's nasty side in the fact that she incorporated such a challenging skill into the system? Who the heck was she plotting against to receive such an attack huh? There should have only ever been one god in this world you know? It's that Kuro guy who's lying there with eyes like a dead fish? I avoid the draconian's attack. I mustn't take that heresy attack. While it's possible to heal the physical body instantly, it's not possible to heal damage to the soul quickly. Whoa man. Just when I thought this was done and dusted it turns out I still had to deal with this joker in the pack huh? Final battle. Even amongst the dragons, I am in a unique position. My abilities that I developed to be used in fighting against gods are like that as well, but fighting that way also requires a significant difference compared to the other dragons. At any rate, my body was created in humanoid form. While the other dragons can become humanoid, that's only ever a temporary form and their true form is that of a dragon. There are no other dragons whose true form is humanoid. Precisely for that reason, there are also no other dragons who fight unarmed like I do. A heresy attack is activated from the heel of the palm. That means it's easily avoided. Since earlier my attacks haven't gotten remotely close. There's too big a difference in our basic abilities. Since the lower half of her body is that of a spider it might look like a big target but that lower half allows her to smoothly move in all directions, making her movements hard to read. Like how I have an unconventional unarmed fighting style compared to dragons, my opponent is also moving in a way that's peculiar to her spider lower body. I find it strange. Conversely, my opponent is increasingly getting used to dealing with my movements. At first she was avoiding my attacks with plenty of margin to spare, but now she's begun to draw me and then avoid at the last moment. She's beginning to see through me. In such a short time. What incredible battle sense. This shows that it's not just that her basic attributes are high, her intuition is as well. My defeat, is just a matter of time huh? I knew it already. While my abilities were intended to be used against gods, it was only ever the intention, being able to fight with them in practice is another matter. My existence only amounts to a futile struggle after my lord is defeated. If I'm lucky or just maybe, such fleeting hopes. Fundamentally, the best course of action is one where my lord is never put in a situation where he has to fight. Strictly speaking, my lord shouldn't ever need to fight. It's even more unreasonable that he should ever lose. It's for that one in a billion possibility alone that I have honed my abilities. Despite the probabilities being so low, my defeat is inevitable. I can't imagine that my strength would be enough against an opponent that my lord was no match for. I have no hope of winning. But so what? If I cannot be successful here, then what have I been living for? Does it mean that I have honed these abilities simply in order to lose? No, 
Absolutely not. The white god points her palm at me. Black energy began to coalesce there. If that fires, the destructive force would likely far exceed that of the breath attacks from the queens. I guess this means that for her, playtime is over. It appears that she has realized that it was overly cautious of her to focus on avoiding my heresy attack, and now she's going to try to finish everything quickly since I wasn't a major threat. That judgment is correct. Between the white god and I, there is an insurmountable gulf. In the first place, there can be no proper contest between a god and one lower than them. It is impossible to use power borrowed from the gods to defeat the gods. However, my will is strong. A torrent of energy is released from the white god's palm. It's approaching me at such terrible speed that I have no time to possibly avoid it. In addition, it would be impossible to endure it by defending. Therefore, I won't avoid or defend. I advance instead. The torrent of energy blows away the bottom half of my body. Not even a trace remains. However, the top half of my body is undamaged. Because the energy was so strong, it went clean through the bottom half of my body. If it had been any weaker, the shockwaves would have caused the upper half of my body to explode as well. Due to the inertia, the upper half of my body continues forwards. Because I have no lower body I can't even brace myself. So even a strike with my fist will have little impact. Even so, this is my last bit of pride. To fight back. Upon seeing just the top half of my body flying towards her, the white god's remaining eye opened slightly in surprise. Using a different hand from the one used to fire the energy blast, she immediately fired out white thread in a radial pattern. If I am caught by that thread, my forward momentum will stop. The only thing that can pass through that netting, is a single fist. I tear off my right hand. I then throw it through a gap in the netting. The top half of my body is then caught by the netting. However, my right hand flies through the netting, towards the face of the white god. The white god turns her face away hurriedly. However, she couldn't completely avoid it, and my hand made a cut in her eyebrow just above her remaining eye. That's all. That's all that betting my life amounted to. A-H-H. This is so frustrating. The sum total of my life was merely to cause such a trivial wound. Still, perhaps this is better than simply rotting away while having never used this power at all. While feeling frustration, as well as a tiny amount of satisfaction, my consciousness fell into darkness. Final battle. Surprise much? Who'd ever expect someone with just the top half of their body remaining to then rip off their own arm and fling it? That's taking throwing away your life to the extreme? Thanks to that I couldn't completely avoid it. There's not much damage. Even if it was an assault clad in heresy attack, a graze would never be able to cause serious damage to the soul. It would be like how it looks, a scratch. What's somewhat annoying, is that due to the heresy attack it seems I can't heal it. The cut is near my eyebrow, but it seems like the blood could trickle into my eye. Since I already have one eye crushed by Kuro, it would be somewhat frustrating for blood to get into my eye and reduce my field of vision. Well, if I ever feel like it I can close my eyes and use fluoroscopy instead, so I'm not too bothered about it really. Still, while it's not like I ever took him lightly, I never expected to get wounded. At first I was on guard against the heresy attack and focused on avoiding it, but once I thought about it I realized it would be better to defeat him right away. After all, unless they're a god, if you blow someone's flesh away then they are going to die. Thanks to that lengthy battle with Kuro, I got it into my head that hitting someone physically is rather pointless. I can't avoid the impression that I wasted some time because of that. Yep, that's right. Most living things would die if you blew away half their body wouldn't they? 
It's that draconian who was the weird one for attacking while having half his body blown away. Yep. Man, he was strong. I'm not being sarcastic, he really was strong. To carry on attacking while only having your upper body left, surely can't be done with ordinary willpower. I even shivered for a moment there. It's amazing that my body could do such a thing after having become a god. Who's that person who said that this was all done and dusted at? I can get damaged just fine. I got wounded despite not making light of him or being careless you know. Perhaps I dropped my guard without realizing it? I gotta refocus my mind. However, I've been able to get rid of the most troublesome looking draconian. I won't be so careless as to relax and have the same thing happen again, but it's certain that victory has gotten much closer. The remaining ones are the fire dragon and wind dragon. They're easy to understand as they're very dragon trademark like dragons. Additionally, the woman the puppet Teratax are confronting is probably an ice dragon. She's using ice to attack for a start. For some reason Imuto-chan is also able to more than contend with the puppet Teratax, but I guess that's down to the teeny dragon wrapped around her arm? These four are the ones I probably need to pay attention to. It's in a different sense, but the other one I need to pay attention to is Yumatakan. It's scary not knowing what his divine protection of heaven could get up to. Also, the Pope is here too, but since he's on the verge of death I guess it's okay. He's collapsed while covered in blood for a start, so surely he can't do anything. Fighting near the Pope is that weird old man I see from time to time. I guess I don't have to pay that much attention to him either. While I think he's strong for a human, that's only for a human anyway. I guess I'll start by defeating the four who might get in the way, the fire dragon, wind dragon, the ice dragon like woman and Imudo-chan. A lot of the puppet Teratax have already fallen anyway. There's four puppet Teratax remaining huh? More than half have already fallen. I'll start with the most conspicuous one, fire dragon, I choose you, against the fire dragon, who is truly a very dragon trademark like dragon and is fighting by spitting out flames while flying, I shoot some darkness magecraft. It's like the darkness bullet from darkness magic. The power isn't much different either. Kua. The magecraft bullet of darkness is a direct hit, and the fire dragon falls down while screaming. The power isn't much different to a darkness bullet. However, this is magecraft rather than magic. Dragons have the dragon scale line of skills that inhibit magic. Because of that I had such a hard time against Alaba, but the dragon scale line of skills cannot obstruct it because this is not magic, you see. More than half of my abilities are imitations of magic skills, so if I just used them as is then they'd be hindered by the magic inhibiting effect of the dragon scale line of skills. However, that's only if. Since I knew that my magecraft would be hindered by them, then it just means that I have to remodel my abilities so that they don't get hindered. Once I realized that Kuro would eventually become hostile, then it follows that the dragons would also become hostile, so I made preparations against that to avoid any mistakes. In the same way, I made it so that attribute resistances and the like are bypassed. At her peak the Demon King had most of her attributes at the maximum nullity level, but even so I could bypass that and cause her damage. These dragons also probably have various attribute resistances of their own at the maximum level, but that's meaningless against me. That draconian earlier obviously looked like a darkness dragon, but my magecraft was effective against him. The dragons might rely upon their dragon scale line of skills for defense, but they have no skill that protects them against my magecraft. They probably have a weak awareness that they should avoid magic as well, so maybe they won't be able to avoid it either? Ah, uh, I guess I spoke too soon. 
Just when I was thinking that it was the Wind Dragon's turn and fired the same Magecraft Bullet of Darkness at him, he avoided it just fine. Hmm. That Wind Dragon is specialized in speed, huh? It sure is hard to target someone flying around at extreme speeds. However, I'd be affronted if you take my aiming skills that I honed in computer games lightly. In truth, the one who played that game was D rather than me, so I've not actually played that game though. Believe in it? My memory? My memory of being good at that game. Predicting the Wind Dragon's movements. Now, the Magecraft Bullet of Darkness that I fired perfectly hit the Wind Dragon in the head. Beautiful. Mew ha ha ha. Okay, let's take them down one after another like this. Final battle. Once Wakabasan appeared, the situation changed right away. Wakabasan thwarted Reese san who was targeting the Demon King, then defeated him. The Black God also seems to have been unsuccessful in his battle with Wakabasan, and has collapsed. In addition, we had no choice but to suffer a long-distance barrage from Wakabasan. Almost as if it had a homing ability, the spell struck Gwensan and Hyavansan with precision. Not only that but she can easily avoid our long-distance attacks. To do something about this situation, I have no choice but to get close to Wakabasan. Katia. I'm going to sneak up on Wakabasan. Wa? Do you understand the situation? Keep it down? It's because I understand that I'll move. Right now, Wakabasan's attention is on Gwensan and Hyavansan. She's glancing at Nirsan and Su from time to time as well, but she hasn't started to attack them yet. She probably decided to start by bringing down large targets like Gwensan and Hyavan San who are in dragon form. She's paying so little attention to Katia and I that I'm almost annoyed. Although I'm saying this about myself, we're the weakest ones in this place, so it makes little difference if we're here or not. I'm sure Wakabasan understands that as well. Which is why her focus is elsewhere. But, even if you can get closer, what could you actually do? It's not like we actually have to do something. Or rather, we can't. So instead, I'll revive Rhys-san. All I can do is use kindness to resurrect the dead. Rhys-san's corpse is lying behind Wakabasan. If it goes well and I can resurrect Rhys-san, then he might be able to make a surprise attack from behind. Would it actually go that well? Doubtful, but if we don't succeed we can't win. We're at a disadvantage now. If this continues we'll definitely lose. In which case, we gotta take a gamble even if the margins are slim. In which case, go to Ranansama first. I see. Just those words are enough for Katya's intentions to get cross. In short, we'll depend upon Ranansama's teleportation, right? Since it's decided, let's go. Sure dot. It can't be helped. I guess I can make a smokescreen for you at least. At the point when we'd reached a conclusion, we heard Nirsan's voice from nearby. Immediately afterwards, Nirsan transformed into her dragon form. Exactly in the right place to conceal us from Wakabasan. To stand out even further, Nirsan used her ice breath attack and fired it at Wakabasan, attracting her attention. Right now, Katia and I should be completely hidden from Wakabasan's field of view. While thanking Nirsan in my heart, we began to move out quietly. Most of the spider type monsters have already been defeated. With nothing to oppose us, and with the fact that the corpses of the spider monsters actually made for good coverage, we were able to conceal our progress. At this rate we'll be able to reach Ranansama without standing out. And so we soon arrived at Ranansama's location. Ranansama was in combat with a large spider monster, an arch -teratect. The arch -teratect is a monster with a danger class of S, just one step below that of the mythical class. They're not something that a single human can hope to take on. Despite that, 
Ron Ansama was fighting equally with that arch terratact. The arch terratact was making use of its huge size to charge at Ron Ansama. Against that charging arch terratact, Ron Ansama shot incandescent fireballs. The arch terratact used darkness bullets to intercept those, but the fireballs swallowed up those bullets and continued onwards. To avoid the inexorable fireballs the arch terratact jumped backwards and to the side, putting some distance between itself and Ron Ansama. Amazing. This is humanity's strongest mage and Julia Senai Sama's magic teacher huh? Ah, now's not the time to be admiring him. As the arch terratact moves towards Ron Ansama again in order to attack him, I stealthily approach it from behind and slash its hind legs. Since it was completely defenseless, my slash managed to cut off one of the arch terratact's hind legs. The arch terratact raised a strange voice. It quickly turned around, putting me in its sights. Are you sure you want to present your back to me? Ron Ansama addressed the arch terratact from behind. At the moment when the arch terratact turned to face him, its body was pierced by heat rays. Having its body pierced by those heat rays, the arch terratact screamed in agony again. I drove my sword into its head. The huge body of the arch terratact made one last spasm, then began to lose the strength in its legs. Its body then crashed to the ground. Phew. I appreciate the help. It's nothing. I believed you could have even beaten it by yourself, Ron Ansama. I simply used a surprise attack, so didn't make much of a contribution. Based on the state of the battle earlier, I thought that Ron Ansama could have even beaten it by himself. Not necessarily. Having to face that class of monster while also protecting this collapsed guy, was a major pain. I looked at the collapsed old man that Ron Ansama was referring to. That old man was the Pope of the Divine Word religion. Using the harmony skill, twice, he nullified the enemy's attack. However, because the backlash of the harmony skill was so large, the Pope collapsed while covered in blood. I'll apply treatment. Ignore, me. The, others, are, cough. The Pope coughed up blood while speaking. He's obviously on the verge of death. Ron Ansama, would it be possible for you to teleport us to where Rissan is? I have, abandoned the Pope. If I used my treatment magic here, I'd be able to heal the Pope's wounds. However, that would not only take some time, but curing the Pope wouldn't meaningfully improve our situation. It's a bitter feeling to abandon someone, but this is something I resolved myself to do. Seriously, this is such an unpleasant thing to resolve oneself for. You know, don't you? Using that power will ravage your own body. I do know. I've resolved myself for it. I looked Ron Ansama straight in the eyes while replying. Seeing that, Ron Ansama quietly heaved a huge sigh and began to activate his magic. I'll cure this guy. It's fine as I doubt I'd be able to take on any more opponents with my abilities. I'll do what I'm able to as far as I can. So I'll say the same to you, you're also going to do only what you're able to. Right. Yes. Dot. That's Ron Ansama's way of saying that he's worried about us, probably. Don't be reckless. But please forgive me. Right now, we can't win without being reckless. And so, Katya and I arrived at Rissan's location via Ron Ansama's teleportation. Final battle. I believed that I wasn't being careless or conceited. However, it's not like I'm omnipotent either. Since there's no way I can know everything, it's normal for unexpected things to occur. If I was in my best condition I could use my magecraft to gather various information to a certain degree, allowing me to take various countermeasures. However, I am currently far from being in my best condition. My battle with Kuro was rather exhausting. There's also the fact that the battle began with Kuro's surprise attack, 
So in the early stages I was in an entirely unfavorable situation. I had originally made plans to lure Kuro into my field, but when hostilities broke out I was thrown into Kuro's field instead. Due to that I first had to work on remaking Kuro's field into my own field. Naturally, Kuro wouldn't allow me to simply do that, so he slashed at me with a sword that had the effect of blocking me from recovering damage to my body. Thanks to that I'm covered in blood. Even so, I was able to remake the field little by little, and just when I finally felt that I'd gotten into a favorable situation, Kuro struck at me fully prepared to die in the process and crushed one of my eyes. I'd take this over having my head split in two, but the damage is still massive. I lost almost all of the clones that were capable of rewriting the field for a start. To put it bluntly, it would be bad if I lose my main body now. Extremely bad. Any more than this and I could really die, because of that I can barely use any energy which in turn means that I can barely use any of my magecraft either. I wasn't being careless or conceited, but it's undeniable that I was heavily restricted in what I could do. For that very reason, I determined the order in which to take on my enemies, dealing with the highest priority ones first. Going by my intuition, the Wind Dragon is the most troublesome one in this place. Next are Imuto-chan and the Ice Dragon. Thanks to that teeny dragon wrapped around her arm, not only has Imuto-chan gotten rather strong but that teeny dragon uses healing magic to provide support as well. The Ice Dragon is the sturdy type. It also has a plainly annoying debuff ability that is making our side weaker as well. Last is the Fire Dragon, who is rather normal. Well, I don't mean weak though okay, or rather, yeah, he has no distinctive traits basically. Yep. I think that to concentrate on these four in order, ignoring the rest, is the correct decision. Yamada-kun's divine protection of heaven is a threat in the sense that it could influence the entire battlefield, but I didn't think it would be particularly useful on a confined battlefield like this. Yamada-kun himself isn't that strong either. Even from the respect of the divine protection of heaven being able to make favorable events occur, I won't lose to Yamada-kun in being able to generate favorable events. It's the same sort of thing with Oashima-kun. While Oashima-kun's barrier is strong in its own way, it's not enough that it can't be overcome. Like Yamada-kun, Oashima-kun isn't that strong anyway and given that she's only able to defend it means that even if I leave her alone she won't be able to become much of an obstacle. The Pope is on the verge of death, so ignore him. The strange old man is strong for a human, but that's only for a human. Ignoring him won't cause problems. If I'd had the spare energy to do so I would have preferred to develop some magecraft to keep track of them as well. However, I don't have any spare energy. In order to achieve the best results from a limited resource, it had been the correct decision to focus on the most important targets first. It should have been the correct decision. So what's up with this situation? I was shooting darkness bullets at the wind dragon and fire dragon. Like with the draconian earlier, I was being careful to keep them from getting close, and intended to wear them down with one-sided long-distance firepower. That should have been the optimal way to deal with them. Despite that, I was suddenly attacked from behind. Something bit into my neck. I felt a part of my soul being chomped off. It's a heresy attack. The same as that draconian huh? Then, when I turned to look at the offender, it was the same draconian. The draconian who should have died earlier, had attacked me with just the top half of his body. What the heck is with this guy? Weren't you dead earlier? Or rather, you can't move with just the top half of your body? Since he's missing his right hand as well, did he jump with just his left hand then? You're being way too tenacious to bite at someone after dying. You're supposed to just stay dead? 
Based on the situation and the visuals you've turned this into a horror story you dolt. I hurriedly tore off the draconian who had bitten into me, slamming him onto the ground. Having a dead body with only the top half remaining, just that was enough to stop the draconian from moving again. No, the fact that he was moving at all is abnormal though. How was he able to move? At that moment, I suddenly had a bad premonition, and looked over my shoulder. What I saw, was Yamada-kun holding aloft a sword. Seeing him it all made sense. The one who resurrected the draconian was Yamada-kun, huh? But, how did he get here? Ah, uh, he was teleported by that weird old man? Ugh, I hadn't paid Yamada-kun's group any attention? This is bad. What Yamada-kun is grasping in his hands, is the hero's sword. A holy sword specially made by D that only the hero can use, capable of unleashing an incredibly powerful attack just once. I don't know the details but the previous hero Julius was able to find it and then the third prince Leston handed the sword to Yamada-kun saying it was something passed down through the generations of the royal family. The moment when Yamada-kun was able to get that sword without knowing its origin, I had realized just how dangerous the divine protection of heaven is. I guess I've underestimated that divine protection of heaven. I hurriedly fired a darkness bullet at Yamada-kun. But that was blocked by the barrier that Oashima-kun had put up. Damn, because I did it on the spur of the moment I guess it wasn't powerful enough to break through Oashima-kun's barrier? Even so, I just need to punch him directly? From my perspective Yamada-kun's is slow. My fist will definitely hit sooner. Of course, I'll pierce right through that measly barrier? Harmony. As my fist struck Yamada-kun's chest, right at that moment, the Pope's voice resounded. Then, my fist only bumped Yamada-kun's chest gently, not even causing the slightest wound. A strange sensation, as if all the power of the strike had gone. Attack nullification? Shit. Yamada-kun has swung the hero's sword. I need to be quick. I activate the evil eye ability in my remaining eye. At least. I tried to. Blood leaked from the eyebrow that the draconian had cut earlier, blocking my vision for a moment. The evil eye ability misfired. Thus, my body was enveloped in the torrent of light that gushed forth from the hero's sword, and was blown away without any trace remaining. Final battle. I won. Wakaba-san's body was smashed into pieces. Immediately after Rhys-san was revived by my kindness ability, he jumped at Wakaba-san while having no lower body, then bit her. He might have been resurrected by my kindness ability, but there was no way he could survive long in such a state. Immediately on being thrown off by Wakaba-san, Rhys-san breathed his last a second time. Naturally, there was no way that I would pass up the opportunity granted during the brief moment when I had Rhys-san's assistance. It's not like I had some sort of specific plan. More like, I instinctively knew that it's now or never and charged in with my sword raised. The magic that Wakabasan fired to intercept me was blocked by Katia's barrier. Most likely, it's thanks to a large amount of luck and a pile of coincidences that my blade was able to reach Wakabasan. Stop fooling around. Brat, open the door quickly. Rush towards the system nexus. Gwensan's furious voice was transmitted to me via telepathy. That's right. This is not the time to be spacing out. Now that Wakabasan is defeated, the route to the door has been opened. Yuri not going anywhere. No, there's still that person. The Demon King had gotten up from her chair and was now standing in our way. However, given how ill she looks, it's obvious that she's straining herself. I can only sense a frail power within her. I'm sure that this person was originally far stronger than us. However, for some reason she's weakened considerably. In which case, maybe even we could beat her. I'll force my way past. No, you won't. 
The demon king yells as if mustering all her power. The next moment, the frail power within her suddenly swelled. The sense of intimidation from her far exceeded that of a queen terror-attacked. Oh, shit. She still, has such strength remaining? Ugh. However, immediately after that, the demon king collapsed to the ground. The incredible strength that had suddenly swollen up within her also dispersed. GNN. The demon king was trying to force herself up with her arms, but convulsions were shaking her body so much that she couldn't even do that. Apparently, after mustering the last of her power, she's broken down to the extent that she can't even stand up. W. We. Aren't. Going to lose. Perhaps it was hard for her even to talk, as even her words were whispered. However, her tenacity surely was huge. Too huge. This is what drove the Demon King to keep battling for so long, even turning the entire world against her. I noticed that Katya has been intimidated by this tenacity. Let's go. I tapped Katya on the shoulder, and ran around the Demon King. W.A. 8. Why I it? While hearing the Demon King's heartbroken cry from behind, even so, I carried on running. Just like how the Demon King was prepared to die in this battle, I couldn't stop here either. Katya and I arrived in front of the door. Upon touching the door, it shone with light, opening automatically. Beyond the door, a completely different scene spread out before us. Unlike the caves from earlier, the floor, walls and the ceiling were all covered in magic circles. Beautiful. Katya seemed to let out that word unconsciously. As Katya had said, this room was beautiful in how there were magic circles covering every surface. However, upon seeing the person in the center of the room, that impression changed. Proficiency requirements met level increased the same voice echoes without pause. That's the same voice that I've gotten familiar with since coming to this world, the voice of heaven. The owner of that voice, is surely that of the woman in the center of the room who is suspended in the air as if being crucified. The lower half of that woman, no longer existed. Despite that, this woman was kept alive and forced to continue speaking as the voice of heaven. This woman, no, this lady, is the goddess Surreal Sama herself. Such a thing, has been inflicted, upon the goddess? The goddess, has been, here, all this time, all alone, while her body is whittled away, she has been supporting this world? This room that moments before I had thought was beautiful, now looks like a hideous prison. What's even more hideous, are those who would forsake the goddess, in order that they themselves could survive her. Us, humanity. I now know the reason why the demon king was so desperate to try to free the goddess. Seeing is believing. No matter how much I had heard that humanity was treating the goddess with ingratitude, without seeing the reality of it in front of me, I hadn't understood how wretched it was. That was now before my very eyes. Even so, please forgive me. I have to do this. I purposefully opened my mouth, to express my determination. This is also for the sake of those who have sacrificed themselves on this journey. I haven't come all this way just to sit on the fence. I want to prevent the collapse of the system right now, but how do I do that? I've come here but I don't even know what to do. If the Pope was here he might know what to do, but he's most likely in no state to move. Using the harmony skill with a huge backlash, he was able to protect me from Wakabasan's attack. It is a skill where using it just once was enough to leave his body covered in blood, but he still used it two more times. In the worst case, he might even be dead. This is not just about the Pope either. Most recently, there was Gwinsan who appealed to me, despite having taken many of Wakabasan's attacks and was lying on the ground. Hyavan San, Nir San, and Su are still fighting with mythical class monsters called Queen Terratacts. It wouldn't be strange that some of them die while I'm dawdling here. 
At any rate, I'll just try whatever I can. For now, let's start with the goddess right in front of me. If I touch the goddess's body, I might be able to understand something. What's referred to as the system's nexus might very well be the goddess herself in practice. I took a step forward while thinking that, when it happened, something fell down from the ceiling. It was a white spider, about a meter in length. In terms of size, it was about the same as a small pterotact, the infant form of the pterotact species. That white spider swung the sickle on its foreleg. Gah! I had used my sword to guard against it, but as if that was nothing, an incredible physical blow sent me flying backwards along with Katia. Then, all too suddenly, I lost consciousness. Final battle. Whiz, whiz. Th, that was close. I never expected my main body to get done in. I took Yamada-kun's divine protection of heaven too lightly? Seriously? I never imagined getting done in by a method that's like threading the eye of a needle you numbskull? Being on guard for such a thing is basically impossible okay? But too bad for you eh? Even if my main body gets done in, then a second or third me will appear before long? Well, yeah. The mere fact that I have clones available means that even if my main body is done in, I'm still okay though. Even though I call them main body and clones, the only differences are in which one I myself am moving, as well as the difference in energy distribution. So it doesn't change the fact that all of them together are in fact my body. So long as my soul is safe then whatever body I move is myself, basically. In short, if you intend to kill me, you'll either have to destroy my actual soul, or otherwise you'll have to smash into smithereens my main body together with all my clones to make it impossible for me to restore myself. For a start, to be able to destroy the soul is a privilege that only gods have, with the exception of stuff like heresy attack or abyss magic and smashing my body into smithereens cannot be done with some kind of basic attack. You could cut an arm or two off and I'd be able to regenerate them instantly as well. Which is why I had thought that once Kuro was defeated my victory was unassailable you see. I never expected to be blown away by the hero's sword. It was a miscalculation. Thanks to that, my main body got done in. This is painful. The energy in my main body got blown away as well. To put it bluntly, I can't participate in any further combat. Using a clone remaining in the system nexus I was able to knock back Yamada-kun and Oishima-kun with a surprise attack. They've fainted, but they're not dead. If they had killed the Demon King, then regardless of the fact that I was short on energy I would have totally murdered them but fortunately they passed up the opportunity to do so. In which case, I'll also pass up the opportunity as a courtesy. The Demon King too. You pushed yourself way too much okay. Despite the Demon King's body being in no state to fight, she was still fine with forcing herself to stand in front of Yamada-kun and co. Since I couldn't move immediately after my main body was done in, I wouldn't have been able to make it in time if they had decided to put an end to the Demon King then and there. The thought of that happening kinda sent chills down my spine. I had knocked back Yamada-kun and Oishima-kun out of the system nexus and beyond the door. I trudged over to where the door was, then quietly closed it. While I was at it, I fixed the door in place with thread. That feels like using packing tape to strengthen a crack in a dam with a hurricane coming on. It should buy me some time if someone tries to open the door. Nobody will be able to enter for a while. Now then, now then, now then. Shall we get the show on the road already? Due to this sequence of unexpected events, my energy is just barely adequate. Any more than this and it would be seriously bad. This means having to walk the tightrope, but just sitting here and waiting is the same. In which case, I gotta do it. Hup. 
My thread pierced the head of the goddess Surreal. Proficiency requirements SSSS. The goddess Surreal's voice stutters with noise as if a bug occurred. At the same time, the remaining half of goddess Surreal's body arches backwards. Her eyes open wide, with an unmistakable expression of pain on her face. Ah, this is not something that I could let the Demon King see. I sure am glad that I closed the door. What I'm doing right now, is hacking the system. Using the goddess Surreal as a medium, I'm directly interfering with the system. Until now, considering the burden placed on the goddess Surreal, I was interfering by attacking from the outside as gradually as possible. But, that sure took a long time. By waiting just a bit more time I could safely cause the system to collapse, but that way perhaps Humaticon or someone will surpass my expectations again. Before anything unexpected can occur, I will settle things. It's Fiaine? The only compensation to pay will merely be the goddess Surreal fainting in agony after sloshing her brain around a bit? Eh? Why am I doing this when we were working so hard to save the goddess Surreal? That's true, but putting that aside I don't like this person for a start. Look, when it's all over she will have been properly saved, okay. The Demon King will be satisfied with that, okay. Actually, I'll be keeping these events a secret from the Demon King anyway. As long as she doesn't find out it's fine, I directly interfere with the system using the Goddess Surreal as a medium. With the enormous magecraft known as the system, I will dismantle a part of it, using the energy gained to restore this planet. The particular part in question, is what's referred to as status values and skills, granted to the living creatures on this planet, the soul enhancing element. The mechanism by which those are used to strengthen the souls of the living creatures on this planet and to recover the energy of those strengthened souls, apart from the bare minimum needed to survive. Except for the part that governs the restoration of this planet, I slice that all off. I will convert that into energy. In doing so, I will also collect the energy associated with the status values and skills that are in turn linked to all of the living creatures on this planet. Because those are associated with their souls, that also means that their souls are disrupted by a non-trivial amount. It's rather like forcibly separating two things that were glued together without using a solvent. And so, the souls of the people of this world might not be able to withstand the impact, due to being repetitively reincarnated and distorted for many years. About half of them will die from the impact. Preventing that is the reason why Kuro and Yamada-kun and Ko fought against us. Now, if I can proceed with this operation, about half of humanity will be sacrificed and the energy to restore this planet will be secured. However. Ga ga ga. While stuttering with noise, the hand of the goddess Surreal seizes me. At the same time, there was a development of magecraft in order to obstruct my interference with the system. Yeah, I figured this would happen. Well, naturally the goddess Surreal would get in my way. Yes, 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 yes. I get it already so behave yourself. Before I cause the system to collapse, I used the energy I had set aside beforehand, to insert a new feature. Seeming to understand what that will do, the goddess Surreal stops her resistance. Sigh. So it comes down to this after all. Well, I expected it to go like this anyway. That's the whole reason why I had preserved some of my energy after all. Thanks to that I'm flat out of energy now, or rather, due to my main body getting done in, there's not quite enough, but, I gotta do this anyway, I trigger the collapse of the system. The feature I had added, is simply a soul protection feature. Previously, I had performed a technique on those close to me and the reincarnators so that their energy won't be extracted. Unlike that, this new feature is simply one that protects the people from dying of shock while their energy is extracted. However, 
Considering that this has to be applied to the entirety of humanity on this planet, it consumes a vast amount of energy that is in proportion to their numbers. I had worked hard to gather the energy for this. Even during my battle with Kuro I didn't touch that energy, and as a consequence of that I was completely on the defensive at the start. Well, if it looked like I wouldn't be able to win I would have still used that energy, but fortunately I was able to turn the battle around. To be honest, I didn't want to use this energy if at all possible. If the goddess Surreal hadn't resisted, I could have collapsed the system while sacrificing half of humanity in the process. But oh well, I guess it's better for everyone to be able to smile with a happy ending when the story is over. So I don't regret this. On top of the energy that I've already put in, I have also included all that which was sustaining my life though. While my consciousness fades, I send a thumbs up towards the Demon King. Since my hand is currently a sickle, it basically just seems like I'm raising that overhead though, but as the Demon King isn't here, nobody but the Goddess Surreal would get to see it anyway. Well, I've successfully done it, Demon King. Epilogue. Miado well? Was the end result satisfactory for you? Dm, I guess. I would call it passable or so. This occurred in a garden dominated by flowers in full bloom. Around a table set in the center, two women were enjoying a tea party. One was the evil god D. The other was a Yamato Nades Hiko type woman wearing maid clothes. D and lo the world was saved due to the self-sacrifice of a single god. And they all lived happily ever after. M there are scars remaining due to the war, but for most it's a happy end huh? D certainly dot. M however, if both the world and humanity could continue to exist together, surely it would have been better to do that from the start. Then wasn't it pointless to have started the war at all? Dio, that would have been impossible. M meaning. D before the war there wasn't enough energy available, so that precondition failed. It was necessary to supplement the missing energy from somewhere in order for both to be achievable. That's why it was necessary ring the maximum possible amount of energy out from the victims of the war and from Black Dragon Jayuri Distodes. Emma, I see. D due to the war occurring and both armies fighting to the death, their skills and status values both improved and consequently the amount of energy that could be recovered also increased tremendously you see. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, that one was originally trying to achieve the objective without a war occurring, right? D I think either would have been fine. To that one, whether the planet was saved or whether humanity was saved, was ultimately down to whatever wish Demon King Ariel wanted. Ultimately, that one didn't care about what happened to either the planet or humanity. M and so was fine with going ahead with a secret plan that involved half of humanity dying. D indeed. I intervened because that wouldn't have been interesting though. M you re as vulgar as ever. D it's cruel of you to call someone as compassionate as me vulgar, given that I allowed Demon King Ariel and the Goddess Surreal to have their final farewells. M.O. That was arranged well I thought. Surely Demon King Ariel was rewarded by that. D it had been previously configured that if the goddess Surreal was ever released from the system then she would die immediately after all. As consideration for her continued support of the system, the least I could do was allow a final farewell as a present. M that consideration only amounts to a single word each to Demon King Ariel and Black Dragon Jayuri Distodes, huh? Surely it wouldn't have hurt to allow a little more. D there are some things that can be conveyed precisely because it was just one word. M is that so? D that's one chapter of that world story done with. It was enjoyable in its own way. M you really do have bad taste. Isn't it going to be awful for that world from now on? D pretty much. Humanity will have to survive in a world where they have suddenly lost their skills and status values after all. 
What's waiting for them is surely an age of turmoil. And would the reincarnators be thrown into that age of turmoil as well? D. Well, that's life. Who knows what will happen after all? Will they successfully navigate the age of turmoil to achieve success, or will they quietly hide away? Will they collapse along the way? I think each person has their own walk in life. M. A. Hands off policy then. D. In the first place they've been on easy street under the protection of that one until now. If we combine their previous life and their current life, they're past their thirties already, so if they can't handle their own situation by themselves it's not interesting for me. M. That's your real opinion at the end there, right? D. Of course. M. Well, in practice, thanks to that one the reincarnators could remain without having been deprived of their energy. So while they would be lacking compared to the time when they had skills, it's still the case that they would be stronger than the other rabble. D. Indeed. While it's unfortunate that Emoticon won't likely be playing much of a role due to having overused his kindness ability, I can have expectations for the other reincarnators. I hope they'll continue to entertain me in future, basically. M. Are there actually any reincarnators that are likely to meet your standards? D. At the least I have hopes for Sophia San, who was the only other survivor in that one's camp. I'm sure that she'll get up to something or other in the future. M. Certainly. D. That being said, the big event is done and dusted. So I don't intend to stick to spectating as strictly as I have until recently. M. You shouldn't have the time for that. Get to work. D. Okay. M. I'll allow it if you limit it to times like now when you're on a break. D. Okay. M. So, what do you intend to do with this one? Like I've been saying, you won't have the time to meddle with her okay? The woman in maid clothes slaps an insect cage. D. Well, I'll leave it in the capable hands of someone from my kin. Given how weak she's gotten, I'm sure it'll require a lot of effort for her to regain her strength. I won't be able to keep her under constant surveillance. M. That's a reasonable decision. D. So, there you have it. Do you understand, Shirauri? I don't understand at all. Just why am I trapped inside an insect cage? Yes. I'm inside this insect cage that's ill-suited to being at a tea party. I'm in the form of a spider small enough to fit on your pinky finger too. At the time when the system collapsed, I was in fact still alive. It wasn't a lie that I summoned all of my energy. It's just that the energy in this mini body wasn't included in that. I completely used up all the energy in my other clones so they were all truly destroyed apart from this mini-body. In addition, the total energy I have remaining is as little as this mini-body indicates. I'm so fragile that I could be squashed like a bug between someone's fingers. However, I actually wanted things this way. After all, going this far was to make D think that I had actually died. Yep, I attempted to fake my own death. In order to make D think that I had exhausted my strength after having to summon all of my energy during that battle. In fact, I did have to summon all of my energy anyway, so thanks to the unexpected event where my main body was done in by Yamadakan I was seriously on the verge of death. However, that should have made my death seem all the more real because of that. If I become such a tiny spider, then even D shouldn't be able to find me after faking my death. At least, that's what I had thought. So why, am I, caught in this insect cage? Why? How? D seriously? When they would go as far as to fake their own death, how could I possibly allow such an interesting being to get away from me? Eek? I somehow sense a dreadful obsession. As if confirming that, the woman in maid clothes looks at me with a pitiful expression, M. I am sure we're going to have a long relationship going forwards, so my best regards, Miss Spider. Ha, ha ha, ha, 
It's precisely because I was afraid of this happening that I tried to escape by playing dead. It appears that my suffering has only just begun. Ugh, but I'll never give up. Someday I shall escape from this evil power. In order to do that I first need to gather power. Or rather, I need to recover the power that I lost. My adventures are just getting started. Translation Notes D and Miedo use that one to refer to Shiro for most of the chapter, which implies that she's not in their immediate vicinity and also leaves the possibility open that they think she's dead. Changing to this one implies she's close at hand, which turns out to be literally the case the whole time. My final comments, and that's a wrap. I'd like to thank the author, Baba Okina, for creating this series and making it freely available. It was a fun ride. I'd also like to thank the translators who came before me and translated a bit over half the series. Without them I'd probably never have gotten interested in this series. As for what I'm going to do next. For now, I'm just going to relax for a while. There aren't any other series that I'm particularly interested in that aren't already being translated. I need a lot of motivation to muster the energy to work on translations, so without a high degree of interest in the series I don't have the motivation. I might retranslate some older chapters of this series at some point but don't count on it. And before you ask, I'm not expecting that any side story web novels to this series will be released in the future. Who knows what the future will bring? but for now I get the feeling that the author wants to go on to something new. As for the ending itself, what did I think? I felt that an important part of the story was Shiro trying to find a way to live with pride. It was raised multiple times very bluntly. So to have an ending without any attempt to answer that doesn't feel satisfying. There's lots of other unanswered questions but that was the main one for me. I always felt that if Shiro simply tried to escape from D, then it would almost certainly be a bad end and that's what it feels like in practice, though it could have been worse. I've not read it yet but as far as I'm aware, the ending in the light novels is approximately the same.